So uh, thank you very much, Judge Rakoff. Um, I would like to, we have a couple minutes for some questions. I would like to first ask our panelists, if you've turned on your microphones, make sure that that's the case. And if you have observations on uh, what the judge has just said. Yes, uh, Todd. Uh, so, okay, is that thing on? Yeah, okay. So I wanted to ask about the prosecutions uh, and your criticisms that we didn't have prosecutions and attributing that to a system in which rich people are favored by the legal system. So I don't doubt that's probably true for a variety of reasons. But I think there may be another factor going on. I'd be interested to hear your reaction. So uh, I think when rich people do simple things, they get prosecuted. So Bernie Madoff did something really simple. Ponzi scheme, never made any trades, just stole people's money. He got prosecuted. He's in jail. Thank goodness for that. The financial crisis was really complex. Well, I have to interrupt by saying, yes, eventually he got prosecuted after 20 years of doing it, even though it was reported repeatedly for the SEC. Yeah, yeah that, that's fine. We can criticize the SEC's failure to do that. But, but, but once they found out what he did, he got prosecuted. He went to jail. No, My no, claim no, is... Okay, so but once we found out, whatever happened up to that point, once we found out what he did, we put him in jail. Uh, the, my claim is that the reason that they didn't go after the financial crisis engineers is because it was really complicated. Even after we found out what they did and they almost ruined the economy, they were not prosecuted. I think that's because it's really complicated. And the people who are lawyers for the United States in the Southern District of New York, all, a lot of them are my friends, are recent law school grads with no training in accounting, no training in finance, no knowledge of any of these complex things. They go after insider trading people instead. Because again, insider trading is, is really simple. They use wiretaps. There's people who are engaged in these kinds of very simple theft. And so that it's really the problem is the lawyers go after the easy cases, which is things like insider trading, things like Ponzi schemes, instead of going after really complex things. And if we had lawyers who were trained in finance and accounting and financial regulation so that they knew about these complex products, and those people became prosecutors, we might see more prosecutions against complex things. Well, I think there's some truth to that. Um, uh, but um, I don't think that's the whole story, because uh, the, the Southern District of New York, for example, uh, uh, back in the 1960s, uh, Bob Morgan, who was the uh, U.S. We haven't even touched on this. 
this, but they thought in part, well, but we keep seeing new frauds. So we've got to change the whole culture of the, of the company. By the way, corporate culture, one of the things, of course, we're dealing with today is, I think, a difficult thing to define. At least many people have, have argued a lot over exactly how to define it, what it means. But I think there is general agreement that it's not easily changed. Uh, but the Department of Justice, in its great wisdom, decided it could change it by imposing increased compliance. And that's where I really have a problem. So let me, let me offer a slightly different perspective on the, the absence of criminal prosecutions. And I guess very first thing I need to say, the standard SEC disclaimer, speak only for myself, not the commission or its staff. I, as, as someone who spent a significant amount of time in the Justice Department during both the SNL crisis and the aftermath of that and the more recent financial crisis, I think it is too simplistic to suggest that the absence of high-level criminal prosecutions from the financial crisis was the result principally of a failure of will in the Justice Department. I think that the, the same sort of zeal and energy, and to some degree the, the, some of the same people who were responsible for bringing the significant numbers of, of SNL era cases um, existed at the time that the, the financial crisis cases were being investigated. And my strong sense from the inside at the time was that it, the cases were not brought because of any lack of interest in doing so, but because the prosecutors in their judgment and adhering to what they believed their, the ethical requirements um, that, that sort of stat standards for what you need to show to bring a criminal prosecution did not permit them to go there. And I think you can quarrel in individual cases uh, with those judgments, but I think that it is painting with too broad a stroke to suggest that, that there was a wholesale um, abdication uh, by the Justice Department by the SEC of, of a willingness to prosecute. I think that what happened actually in some respects for kind of thinking through some of the, the comments you made about the complexity of the transactions, the documents, I mean, that, that this, is, this is an episode that in some respects is a sobering lesson about the limits of criminal prosecution as a remedy when we're dealing with complex, fragile financial systems with multiple layers of actors, the top ones who, who may well, partly by design, partly just by the structure of the system, be shielded from um, knowledge of the, the blatant fraud that goes underneath, partly because of some of the challenges of expertise um, that, that you've referenced. But I think it's the the I think that the notion uh, that we can sort of fix or prevent a repetition of the kinds of problems we had with the financial crisis um, with a mindset change, uh, attitude adjustment of, of criminal authorities uh, is too simple. And I think that something more fundamental uh, was at play. Uh, in limiting the number of criminal prosecutions. So your well, response, and then we'll turn it to the audience. So, well, first of all, of course, I'm sure whatever I said is too simplistic. I'm a simple, barefoot federal judge. What do I know about <laughs> these things? But um, the, uh, I don't think the record fully bears out what you just said for several reasons. First, the initial statement from the Department of Justice as to why it wasn't going after um, uh, uh, individuals uh, came from uh, then Attorney General Holder, who I, I have no question is a uh, 
a dedicated public, was a dedicated public servant, and a great lawyer now, uh, who said it would be bring too much danger to the economy. He withdrew that comment later on after intense criticism. But basically he was saying is, we can't go after them because we're already in a terrible financial crisis. This will just make it worse. I would suggest to you that, first of all, that probably wasn't um, accurate even on its own terms and shouldn't have been played a role in the Attorney General's determination in any event, but really has absolutely nothing to do with going after individuals. If you go after a large banking institution at the height of the financial crisis, perhaps arguably it will have a negative effect on the recovery of the economy. If you're going after an individual, there's no, no reason to believe that going after a particular individual would impact the economy at all. Um, so other than restoring public confidence and justice in this, in this country. Um, so that was the initial Justice Department position. Uh, later on, Lanny Brewer, Brewer, another who was chief of the criminal division uh, uh, for the Department of Justice, another wonderful public servant. I don't, I don't question at all the good faith uh, of these folks, but his position was, well, you can make a case that collectively the bank engaged in some mis uh, giving, but not that any individual, at least no high-level individual, did. He had to walk away from that, too, because the federal law is that with the possible exception of the Bank Secrecy Act, you can only go after a company of any kind for criminal misconduct if you have an individual who has committed that same misconduct. It's a simple respondeat superior. And although that could be a low-level individual, the Department of Justice policy, for, and, and wisely so from time immemorial, is that you don't go after the company unless at least mid- uh, or high-level individuals uh, are involved. So that made no sense at all. And the fact that there were these two dubious statements given by our highest-level Department of Justice people involved in this does make me wonder what else was going on. Now, you're right, it's complex, but let's, let's take the case of the SEC versus the Department of Justice, putting you right on the horns of the dilemma. Uh, the, uh, so the SEC, in one of its best cases, in my view, in 2009, brought a, a case against the top-level people at Countrywide. Countrywide uh, was the single largest mortgage broker um, uh, in, the, in the United States. Many years later, they were the subject of a trial at my court, and I got to see firsthand some of the questionable practices in which they engaged, as the jury so found. Um, the, um, uh, so the SEC went after Angelo Mazzillo, the CEO, and several people right underneath him, and they brought an action accusing them of knowing that the mortgages were much worse than they were representing them to be. And they quoted in the complaint from Mr. Mazzillo's emails in which he described the, the uh, mortgages that he was selling as acceptable to banks as, quote, toxic and, quote, poison. Now, that's pretty darn good evidence, it looks, it sounds like to me, of what, what the top-level guy knew. Mr. Mazzillo settled that case okay. about a week before trial for $74 million, which in those days, from the SEC standpoint, was a big uh, settlement, particularly for, for an individual. It was then turned over to the Department of Justice was not turned over to the Southern District of New York. I, here's my bias in favor of expertise, but we have, th that uh, uh, office had the expertise. So it was turned over to the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Central District of California, and if I'm not mistaken, I, I think I'm right on this, to their Sacramento uh, office, because that's where Countrywide was located. Um, and, uh, and, uh, 
that office had no expertise in these kinds of cases. Two years later, that office issued a one-sentence statement, public statement, we have decided not to criminally prosecute Mr. Mazzillo. To this day, no explanation has ever been given for why that was so. Was it the complexity? Was it the difficulty in showing intent? Um, uh, why wasn't the evidence that the SEC uh, had uh, so portrayed right in their own complaint uh, enough to bring a criminal case? I don't know, you don't know, no one knows. But I think there are questions there that could fairly be raised. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Um, I have two of my students who can take microphones to people who ever want to talk. So, um, yeah, Ryan and Ann, you could go to the back there and get the microphone. <coughs> So, um, good. So given, so given that the DOJ can impose um, individual liability on executives, um, from a student's perspective, please help me understand if the CLO and the CCO role should be separated, and if so, what function should they manage? Or do you think um, a CLO, the chief legal officer, can do all of the roles without any conflict of interest to, in building an effective compliance culture? So I hope others on the panel who may uh, be close to that issue that I am will also comment. But uh, there's, if you read Ben Heidemann's book, he describes the very long convoluted debate that's going on about whether certain positions should be combined or, combined or separated, whether who should report to whom, and all like that. And he says it really doesn't matter. Uh, what he says is uh, what is critical is that everyone who has any role of importance in the uh, monitoring of a uh, company's conduct and the detecting of its uh, 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 misconduct coordinate on a daily basis uh, and be, uh, and secondly, that they be given total and complete support by the CEO. And he thinks those two things are much more important than any of the um, niceties of who's combined, who's separate, who's um, uh, uh, reporting to whom and so forth. So I just mentioned that as, as at least his perspective. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> um, so you you spoke a lot about what you suggest be done differently, and maybe the. Justice Department or with the regulatory agencies, what are your suggestions for compliance and legal professionals working in-house in businesses now? Well, as I mentioned, the responsibility or monitoring what goes on in a company has to a very large extent passed inside in a way it wasn't true 50 years ago. Um, so it is uh, the inside chief legal officer who really uh, makes the tough legal decisions, not the outside lawyer. It is the inside uh, uh, either chief financial officer or a top accounting person who makes the tough uh, accounting standard uh, determinations, not the outside auditors. This is a, a significant change, uh, but there, there's no turning it back in my view. Um, so what those folks lack is the same independence that the outsiders have. 
um, because they are, when all said and done, employees who are um, dependent on uh, management uh, for their very jobs, let alone um, their pay and other uh, uh, aspects. So the question is how to uh, provide inside at least a modicum of increased independence um, to replace the lost um, uh, independence from the outside professionals. And I think um, uh, there may not be any way to do it entirely, uh, but part of it is uh, having uh, uh, them, uh, their uh, bosses really be the independent directors of the board rather than management. Independent members of the board setting their pay, setting their tenure, setting all that. Independent members of the board being the people they report to um, uh, on any matter of, of importance. Um, uh, the, um, now that would not sit well with uh, many managers who say that's no way to run a company. We, we need to, the managers have to manage and, and that includes every function, but it, I'm suggesting that uh, it nevertheless would provide a certain amount of independence for the people who are, whose roles are those of quasi-professionals um, and who need to have an independence in order to exercise the professional part of their duty. Uh, there are other things I'm sure that could be done. Uh, 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 a, um, uh, I keep coming back to Ben Heinemann, so I'll tell you why. Um, General Electric, has always been a, a, a important uh, company. In the 1950s, no one here was alive then, but I was, uh, uh, their uh, GE executives were the first to ever go to prison for antitrust violations. And it was big headlines. I remember it as a, a young boy growing up. Um, and that was, uh, a, if you will, a wake-up call for GE, uh, which had prided itself on its law-abiding corporate culture, and there it was, its own top-level people going to prison. Um, and um, so they turned things around, and one of the things that they did, although it wasn't until a decade or so later, was to bring in uh, uh, Ben Heinemann as general counsel. Ben Heinemann had been a Rhodes Scholar, uh, he was number one in his class at uh, Yale Law School, though, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he, w he was uh, a terrific and very smart person. Ben Heinemann created the first large in-house counsel uh, program of any major corporation. He grew it in the... Uh, 25 years that he was there, he grew G's in-house uh, lawyers from 40 to 500. Huge increase. Um, but he insisted at all times that he be given a role in any decision of the corporation, including business decisions, that could in any way uh, present uh, legal issues. So he played a role very similar to what an outside counsel used to play. And Jack Welsh, the CEO, uh, who, who was uh, devoted to Ben Heinemann, encouraged him to play that role and brought him in formally or informally on every major decision made. And the result was that GE never faced this kind of scandal it had faced in, in the 50s. So it can be done. A lot of it is in the attitude of the CEO, but I also think even when the CEO is not willing to play that kind of role, there are ways to design around that, such as what I suggest. Okay. Uh, Judge, uh, fair disclosure, I'm, I've been an in-house counsel for over 30 years, so I, I, um, the I understand your point about the buildup within companies of, of large compliance staffs and lawyers, in-house lawyers. I also, I also understand the, the point about independence, but I guess another point, a counterpoint would be that 
um, another trend is for um, in-house departments to, to create a better compliance culture within a company. You know, they know the clients, they know the, the, the people within, they can train them, and they can create this compliance culture that ultimately will lead to good decisions. They'll, they'll be able to detect um, misconduct um, even before it happens, and, you know, that, that there'll be this great, greater communication piece. So there's, there is a really a strong role for, for in-house counsel in, in, this, in this kind of piece. So I don't mean to be misunderstood in that I think I'm all for enhanced compliance, uh, but uh, what I'm more skeptical of is what it can be, what it can do alone, and I'm also skeptical of how much of it can be imposed from uh, the government. The the um, you know, we're, we're talking about corporate culture, and as I mentioned before, I think that's a, a term a lot of people have had trouble defining. Um, but presumably, it at least means uh, creating uh, uh, norms of behavior that everyone in the company, from the janitor on up, feels is part of what this company is all about. And I think. Um, it's very hard to impose that from outside. And so where compliance programs have been imposed from outside and are viewed by even the insiders as something imposed, they become checklists. Oh yeah, we know we gotta uh, satisfy the checklist that this compliance officer uh, has foisted upon it. But it doesn't create uh, norms. There's an old saying which you may have heard that um, three pages of principles, of ethical principles fully supported uh, at all times by the CEO are worth them more than 30 pages of rules imposed from outside. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, so um, uh, I, I am not at all impo uh, opposed to um, increased in compliance programs on the part of companies. I'm just skeptical of how much can be done by the government in changing corporate culture through imposed compliance programs from outside. Um, has the Dodds-Frank legislation or any federal statute restored any of the protections or restrictions that existed under Glass-Steagall? Well, I'd be very interested in hearing the, the, the SEC's view uh, on that. Um, uh, the, the, we can have a long debate over Glass-Steagall. My own view is it was a big mistake to repeal it. Um, but uh, whether that uh, is true or not, um, uh, certainly, Dodd Frank was intended to restore some of, in a, in a more sophisticated way, some of the problems that had arisen since the repeal uh, of Glass Steagall. Um, you know, Dodd Frank was a huge burden to the SEC. They were suddenly told, you know, right these umpteen, you know, hundreds, thousands of regulations, and they're still in the process to some extent. Uh, and now uh, it may be that some of that will be undone in, in the current political situation. Um, so uh, I think it's too soon to, to really evaluate uh, Dodd-Frank, but I think there are others here who probably have a more uh, nuanced view of that than I do. So one more question, and then we'll turn to the panel. I've exhausted you, so if you oh, there's one over there. Yeah. Okay, you uh, mentioned that um, there were um, some um, that there was a difference between um, the. Um, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Okay, okay. Pardon me if I'm not um, articulating myself very well. <laughs> there, you mentioned that um, there were there was a difference um, when when it came to um, enhanced compliance, whether um, the um, com whether um, the CEOs saw it as like just like congruent with with their own um, corporate culture, and then others that found it too burdensome. 
did you um, notice any patterns, um, like what particular um, things were um, seen as too burdensome, or? Well, the the um, I do commend to you. This is not a, a direct answer, but I do commend to you. Uh, uh, Brandon Garrett's book, uh, Too Big to Jail, which, as I say, does an exhaustive summary uh, of all the deferred prosecution and, and corporate prosecutions, even if not deferred, uh, from 2000 to 2014. And, and it took him many years because of, uh, well, one unfortunate thing about uh, deferred prosecutions and even something called bond prosecution agreements, which also exist, is there's very little of the public record about them. So you don't know how they work out. For example, when a deferred prosecution agreement comes before a federal judge, he or she has to sign off on it at the beginning with a lot, a lot of deference to the parties, as I am well aware. Uh, but uh, the... Um, uh, uh, but the judge does not see what happens thereafter, except in very unusual circumstances. So a, uh, you, will, uh, you will sign off, if you're a judge, on a deferred prosecution that says um, the following uh, 25 uh, new forms of compliance will be put in place. And the company will pay for them and will and sometimes there's a monitor and sometimes there's not, but in either case they will report directly or indirectly to the Department of Justice. But if something goes wrong, what happens? Usually the Department of Justice works it out with the company. The judge doesn't see that. It's only in the rarest circumstances that the violation of the agreement is so egregious that the parties come back to the court and say, take action. So. It's very hard for me to know what works and doesn't work in that sense because I don't see the end result. What Brandon Garrett says is um, that it uh, uh, doesn't work uh, in many, many, many cases because, as shown by the high degree of recidivism. Um, he recommends, among other things, uh, having more hands-on involvement by the judge. Um, I think that's a splendid suggestion, but I say that with some trepidation because my colleagues will say, oh my God, more work? What the hell do you want? Uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, that might be a, a good way. But other than that, it's hard for me to, to respond to your question. 